Well, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Wolfona, and I am very thrilled to see so many of you joining us on YouTube. And it is a really huge privilege for me today to take an hour of our time to talk to Dr. Emily Chamley White about her insights um, and research on Hurricane Katrina, which was a disastrous hurricane in New Orleans. And what we can learn from these lessons for the pandemic that we're living in right now. I hope that all of you are safe and sound um, in your homes and that you and your family are doing well. And uh, I'm Wolf and I'm the CEO of Students for Liberty. And we are a 12 year old organization that works with students all around the world. And what we do is we give tools and resources to students who are interested in classical liberal ideas, free markets and free speech. And once you give them the tools and resources, our students are going out there and spread the ideas of liberty. So much so that in the last year, we had 2,700 events with over 120,000 people attending those events. And unfortunately, um, right now, many of those are online, but fortunately it gives us a chance to talk to very interesting people all around the world. And uh, we are starting today with uh, Dr. Emily Chamley Wright. Emily is the CEO and president of the Institute for Main Studies, a fantastic organization that I'll tell you a little bit more about later. But uh, Emily is now since 2016 involved with the Institute for Main Studies and she has a PhD in economics and she used to be the provost and dean at Washington College. And her research is really, really fantastic um, because I have used that also in my own PhD when I worked on crisis as well as lawmaking during crisis. And the framework that you have developed was very fun, very interesting and very riveting to me. So I'm glad that you are here today now to share some of your insight with us. And when you're not talking about your research, of course, you are leading the Institute for Main Studies, which is a very prestigious and old organization here in the United States who works with uh, graduate students, but also professors all across the country and sometimes even the world. And you are helping them to give them the best resources and um, opportunities so that they can become more effective advocates for the ideas of liberty as well. And I'm very fortunate that I'm alumnus of Institute for Mind Studies and uh, I was a scholarship holder. And all of you should uh, check out the website. It's uh, theihs.org, T-H-E-I-H-S.org, if you wanna check out what kind of opportunities they have. It's really an intellectual treat to be part of their programs. And um, with that, I just want to say, welcome, Emily. Thank you so much, Wolf. And thank you for the kind words for IHS and for me. I appreciate it. Of course, of course. And uh, we will roughly talk for like 40 minutes and then we take 20 minutes of all of your questions. I have the YouTube link here online and uh, I will take your questions a little bit later. But let us start with the most important question that is on everyone's mind right now. What can your research tell us? When and how can we get a haircut again? <laughs> I wish I could tell you that. I wish I could tell you that answer. And that really is the vexing thing is the, the degree of uncertainty that the pandemic has generated. And, and that is one of the, the commonalities with what we learned about and what uh, people who experienced Hurricane Katrina in the Gulf Coast also experienced was this sort of devastating level of uncertainty. And that becomes a, a really, really thick um, a thicket of, of challenge in the moment of a national crisis is the, uh, is that in, is that deep uncertainty. So, yeah, let's start with that and tell us a little bit more about what made you interested in studying Katrina, what has happened and um, yeah, start with that, please. Yeah. So let me, let me start out since uh, some of the people who are listening to this were either very young or might not have even been born at the time of uh, Hurricane Katrina. So it hit the Gulf Coast in uh, 2005, August 29, 2005. It was a massive hurricane in size, in, in its breadth. At its height, it was, a it was a category five hurricane. When it hit the Gulf Coast, its leading edge hit uh, the Mississippi Gulf Coast with, uh, with very strong winds. And the event in Mississippi was essentially the winds and the storm surge, so storm surges that reached up to 26 feet on the coast, wiping out the coastline. In Louisiana, in New Orleans in particular, the event was much more of a water and 
water event because the hurricane stalled right over New Orleans and it dumped a ton of water on New Orleans, which then, uh, you know, overtopped and then eventually breached many of the levees that had been uh, experiencing for a variety of reasons, a, a, a decay, and they, they, they just failed. The whole levee system failed in New Orleans. Now, the topography of New Orleans in, and one of the unintended consequences of a levee protected area is that over time it tends to sink. And so in New Orleans, you had at its lowest point of the city, it's six feet below sea, sea level. So when the levees broke, and the water came in, it essentially flooded 80% of the city. And that those floodwaters stayed until they could be pumped out. So it was devastation of two very different kinds across the Gulf Coast. And we were really interested in understanding, well, what would be the varied responses across states, across communities? What would be the varied responses to try to catapult a rebound and recovery? And what could we learn from that? We felt that we understood that there was just a ton that was that was being learned on the ground that only could be accessed if we had boots on the ground as well. So we had a team of ethnographic researchers who worked to interview people who had returned, uh, community leaders, but also just sort of the you know, typical residents, business leaders, and, and small business owners who had returned. And also we interviewed people who were displaced but did not return. And so to see what we could learn. And the top line of, of what we were after here is that, you know, all of the systems, all the social systems that make society work, uh, the economic systems, the civil society systems, local government, were all wiped out. And so we wanted to understand how the rebuilding process was going to, uh, could unfold with an eye towards what that could teach us about how society works generally, as you see whole systems wiped out and then reconfigured and reemerge, there was a real opportunity for us to understand better how society works in normal times. That's fascinating. And uh, we will talk a little bit later also about your insights um, that can help us understand how do we rebuild the whole world after COVID. And, um, but uh, we get into that a little bit later. So one theme of your research, which I always appreciated, is that you and your colleagues try to discover spontaneous orders, which are basically orders which are made by human action, but not by human design. So they are unintended consequences. And I think you're making the case in your research um, on Katrina specifically that often bottom-up processes, the processes that come up within the community, are more effective than top-down approaches. Can you tell us why that is? So, so let's start with markets, because markets are one of those bottom-up approaches, bottom-up uh, avenues by which people rebound and recover after a catastrophic disaster. And so we, we already know that that's the case, that we, certainly we knew that going into our Katrina research is that markets come in and provide both the incentives and also the knowledge signals that people need so that they know how to respond. And so this is one of the reasons why economists in particular are, are, are um, really push hard against price controls and, and anti-gouging uh, legislation in the wake of a crisis because those price signals are so precious for sending the signal to those people who can provide solutions as well as the incentive to provide those solutions. So um, markets are, are an example of a bottom up uh, recovery process or mechanism by which communities can recover. But one of the things that we were noticing was that uh, New Orleans was coming back much more slowly than than we were anticipating because there were there there were lots of opportunities for people to uh, rush in and create and and take advantage of of good opportunities uh, to rebound and rebuild. But it was happening more slowly than we were expecting, so we wanted to understand why. One of the big reasons why. Uh, we were seeing much slower response across New Orleans generally, is that there was an impulse 
from uh, the city leaders to have a kind of top-down engineering approach to finding solutions. Uh, the earliest version of this was the Bring New Orleans Back Commission. That was replaced by subsequent string of commissions to, to try to un untangle all of the challenges with respect to rebuilding. But in that early phase, it was the idea was, well, we can't let individual communities to just decide to come back on their own. We can't let individual residents or business people come back on their own without sort of like an orchestrated effort. Because otherwise, then you get a kind of of Halloween effect where you've got some lights on and some lights off and, and you've got some people back and other people across the street not back and, and then it's not going to be a viable community. And so there was this impulse to say there's this massive collective action problem. We need to solve that problem from the top down and engineer the solution. And then people got really, really excited uh, glimmers in their eye that said, and uh, while we're at it, while we're, you know, getting people um, brought back in an orchestrated, uh, engineered fashion, we're going to engineer out all the problems that we had in New Orleans before Katrina hit. And so there is this impulse to try and, and recreate everything in its perfect, in a kind of perfect mode. And what that essentially did is it kept people waiting on the sidelines. They were waiting for those signals for that permission to come back. And that waiting was devastating to communities because people were trying to, you know, they were on the sidelines, they were in Shreveport, they were in Houston, they were in Baton Rouge. They wanted to come home but they wanted to see that there was life in their community. But because there were all these signals coming from uh, the municipal authority and through and through other layers of, of government, state government, federal government, there were a lot of forces that conspired to keep people on the sidelines, I think with good intention. Uh, but the effect of it was that people's expectations started to anchor around the negative, that they weren't seeing people to come back. So they started to say, well, maybe I shouldn't plan to come back or I should wait longer. And then that became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Communities didn't come back because people weren't coming back, right? That there wasn't that, that bottom-up signaling uh, that let people know that, hey, maybe it does make sense for me to come back. So that was one, that was, that was one key takeaway. But the other key takeaway and you know, really interesting puzzle to us was that that. A lot of communities did see rebound and recovery uh, much faster than expected. Uh, a lot of communities that were counted as like, oh, no one is ever going to return to this community. It was so poor prior to Katrina, and it was devastated by the flood catastrophically. No one's ever going to come back to the Lower Ninth Ward. And yet people did come back. So we were really interested about that question. Why were people coming back? What were the motivating what, what were the motivating factors that, that, that brought people back despite the challenges, despite if you did the cost benefit analysis, it wouldn't have made any sense to come back, but people were coming back. And despite the fact that the, the mayor's office was saying, don't come back, you saw communities coming back and defying that authority. That was interesting to us too. We wanted to understand why they were coming back and then how they did it to, despite all those odds. That's fantastic. So I hear you really say that if there's like people making decisions for everyone else, as for instance, the mayor or like these different uh, bureaucratic um, roundtable discussions, that that not necessarily might be like the safest way on paper, but it might not be like the, the way that the communities really need it at that point. And that the folks on the ground and that have lost their homes there that were able to make the decisions much better for themselves than somebody who was from doing this from the top down. That's very interesting. So maybe you can share with us like one of the most inspiring bottom-up stories that you've seen in your research about Katrina, where the community came together and rebuilt it. And so one of the, I will, and one of the uh, kind of overarching themes of our work was really to understand how people were leveraging uh, socially embedded resources. And, um, and one of the socially embedded resources that we found was that people were telling stories of their own community and telling stories of their neighborhood. New Orleans is a, is a very neighborhood focused city and, and people identify as New Orleanians, but also they identify with their specific neighborhood. So one example was the Mary Queen of Vietnam community in New Orleans East. And that community came back uh, and in defiance of uh, the Bring New Orleans Back Commission and in defiance of, of the mayor's office that were saying, no, you're, 
the community was too badly damaged. We're not even sure that we want to even allow rebuilding in that area. And so uh, Father Vien of the Mary Queen of Vietnam Catholic Church immediately started organizing people going from evacuation site to evacuation site, organizing people to say, we're going to come back. We're going to come, anybody who's capable of coming back, you know, if you're healthy, for example, come on back and we're going to be, um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to fix the church. And it was, it's such an inspiring story because uh, Father Vien was very savvy. He understood that if they fixed the church and they brought parishioners back, he knew that the optics would be incredibly bad to bring in bulldozers to raise the community as people were coming back to worship. He knew that that would just be politically a non-starter for the city. So he, he, he orchestrated folks to, to come back. And one of the ways he did that, it was to tell the story of the community. That community had really been forged out of three separate villages in Vietnam that had been displaced in the 1950s uh, from the communist regime from North, North Vietnam to South Vietnam. And then in the 70s, after the Vietnam War, they were displaced again and brought to, through Catholic charities, brought to New Orleans. And so they could tell that story about literally floods that they had experienced in Vietnam, the dislocation that they had experienced before. And they would tell that story over and over and over again as a way to say, you know what, this is hard, but we've been through something like this before. We've been through much worse and we survived and we are still a community. And so that, that became a how is, you know, why did people come back? Because they saw that community as their second homeland. How they came back was to leverage those socially embedded resources like that art of association so that they could orchestrate that return. So that was one example that was, that was really powerful to us and really captured our imagination. It was one of the first communities to come back. So that guided our thinking as we started to then look at rebound and recovery in other communities like the Lower Ninth Ward that had been so devastated. We saw similar kinds of stories of people kind of fashioning the local storytelling of the community as a tool to leverage an eventual return. That's beautiful. And that, that makes the importance, that shows that you're so much more than an economist because you're looking <laughs> at, you're looking at like how people transmitted stories and how that really shaped their excitement to coming back and, and encourage people to come back besides just like looking up, okay, how much do I have to pay for this rebuilding this house now versus moving somewhere else? And uh, that means a lot to people. I like it. Um, so generally, when we see crises around the world, governments' response is to have like one agency coming in and to increase their scope and power. We've seen this over and over again, and we're seeing this right now during the COVID-19 crisis as well. Um, this, this effect is called the, the, the wretched effect, going back to uh, historian Robert Hicks in his book, Crisis and Leviathan. And of course, uh, the government did that also with Katrina. And I think specifically the agency called uh, FEMA, the, let me just see what it stands for, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, um, they stepped in and I think they were heavily criticized afterwards because they did not always do the right thing and they actually harmed the recovery of Katrina. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, how, how FEMA stepped in and what went wrong there? Yeah, so, so first, we should give credit where credit is due. So that very same community, the very Mary Queen of Vietnam community that I described, was also one who was benefited by a FEMA trailer park um, that came in and allowed people a place to live proximately in the near term. So as they were uh, redeveloping their um, uh, their own homes and rebuilding their own homes. So that was a case where uh, they could move in resources relatively quickly. Uh, that that was a, a community because they had orchestrated that return so quickly and so publicly. They did get the attention of uh, federal agencies and the local authorities to say, okay, we can't stand in their way now. So they started to, to move forward. Um, uh, in a way that was that that uh, that the Vietnam uh, Vietnamese community really said FEMA was very helpful, so that gives us a clue as to how uh, uh, government agencies can be helpful is to focus in on the thing that they have a comparative advantage of of offering. So in this case, it was a way to provide housing 
close into the community itself. So it reconnected the community and so that they could uh, benefit from those, from those connections and that art of association that, that I just described. Where it became much more difficult was in a, I'll tell a different story, uh, in St. Bernard Parish, for example, FEMA came in and their focus, St. Bernard Parish is to the Southeast of New Orleans. It's a, it's a different parish, but it was a, impacted much as the Lower Ninth Ward was because it's essentially downstream from the uh, breach of the uh, industrial canal that uh, devastated the Lower Ninth Ward. So it was, uh, it's a parish that's surrounded by water on all three sides. It was absolutely devastated by floodwaters. And there was a, there's a, a local superintendent, the superintendent of the uh, St. Bernard uh, public school system, uh, Doris Vodier, who said, you know what? I need a place for the uh, first responders, kids to come to school, because if we don't keep the kids here, if we don't keep, have a place for the kids to go to school, we're going to lose those first responders. They're, you know, talking about their local police, their local firefighters, the people who lived in, in St. Bernard prior to Katrina, they didn't want to lose those folks because they were so central to the rebuilding efforts and, to, and, and to, uh, uh, making sure that the place was was going to be safe in the near term and 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 improve uh, further on. So they set up a, a, a uh, Mrs. Vodier uh, set up a, a registration. Uh, this was just weeks after the storm. And she said, if anybody who registers their kid uh, for, on the November 1st uh, registration, we'll have a place for your kid to come to school. And they were they were expecting, you know, like like 50 families to come back. And, and sign up. Instead, it was like 700. And she's like, wow, this is incredible. So that, that there was this, this, this acted in a way like the church did for Mary Queen of Vietnam, is that the return of the school system became like the anchor that said, okay, if that's back, I can come back. And so that was one of the themes we kept seeing over and over again. So in this case, you'd want FEMA to come in and say, okay, we're with you. What can we do to help? How can we support? How can we support your efforts from the bottom up to rebuild the school system? And instead, what she got was a team of FEMA experts coming in and putting up barriers on everything from endangered species protocols to uh, how to make sure that they were rebuilding in a way that was in compliance with historic preservation protocols. This was a community that was entirely flooded. There was no preserving of historical properties at this stage of the game. The historical properties had snakes and swamp grass in them, right? That's the problem that they needed solving. And so she felt really frustrated by that. And she even had to circumvent um, procurement protocols that got her put under investigation for some point for misuse of federal property. Of course, you know, somebody caught wind of this and said, oh, this is bad. We should not be doing this. And so the, the uh, charges were dropped. But the point is, she had to invest all of that time navigating, negotiating with the bureaucratic structure of FEMA. And the, and the whole time she kept wondering, who's here to help me? Right? Shouldn't you all be here to help me not put barriers in my way? So that was one of the other kinds of a story that illustrates the kind of theme that we saw. Yeah, that's a very powerful example, and it, it, it speaks to what you've said before, that it really it needs the people on the ground who have the, the right information to make the, the calls instead of the bureaucrats who might only go through like a checklist of things that they need to see. Um, so that, that's a fascinating insight. So would you then say that there is a place for a centrally organized agency like FEMA, or should that be more addressed on a state level, that a state addresses crises more locally? Or would you say that we need something on the federal level as well? Because that could also give us some insights about the CDC right now here in the United States or the World Health Organizations around the world. Yeah, I don't think the question is an on-off switch of should we have it or should we not? I think it's a matter of we're going to have state level agencies, we're going to have national agencies, and also, you know, uh, in the in the context of the pandemic, uh, there I think that there's value to having international cooperation as well. The question isn't whether, in my mind, the question in my mind isn't whether we should have them. It's it's given that we have them, what should they be doing? And so the guidance I, I think just in a very broad you know top line level should be 
to have these organizations and agencies do what they have a comparative advantage in doing. So in the, in the case of Katrina, it was things like getting the lights on, getting the lights on, removing in, uh, 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 road debris from the middle of the roads. And when I talk about debris, I'm talking about yachts that had been, uh, you know, put into the storm had, uh, uh, had left in the middle of a roadway. So people couldn't get to their home if you had, you know, uh, trees that were felled across the highways and across the local road system, you couldn't get to your property to start fixing it up. So do the things that you can do have a comparative advantage in doing as an agent, as a government agency with the resources of the federal government or the state government behind you, but also, and do it quickly, do it quickly with the eye towards tapping the potential, the capacity that rests within the hands of local residents, of local businesses, of biz big businesses. They all have different capacity as well. They can do things that maybe smaller local companies can't do, but a Walmart or another big box store can do the things as an agency that tap the capacity at the lower level so, and then do it quickly and then get out of the way mostly, you know, because that's the other thing is that there is this once, once federal and state presence, uh, government presence is in the community, it has a, a, an, a systematic um, bias towards staying. It has a systematic bias towards overprotection and staying too long because no one wants to be the, the, um, uh, the decision maker who makes the call to take, say, the military police out of a community, and then something bad happens, right? Because then they're on the hook for, well, why did you remove the military police? Someone got hurt because you made that call too soon. And so then they're exposed. So their, their bias is always towards overstaying and overprotecting, because then if they overprotect, it causes problems too. It, it delays return. It delays the sense that normal life is returning, but that's a bell that doesn't ring, right? It's not in the way that say, if someone got hurt, that's a bell that rings. So there will always be this inherent bias for government help to stay too long, to overprotect, to overpolice. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And, um, I hearing um, in your research and how you present these things, like it seems like that you're very much also focused on solutions that have a polycentric order. Am I correct in, in seeing that in your research? Yes, um, and and so uh, just for those who are are not familiar with what polycentric order means, it's it's very similar to that bottom up approach to finding solutions that you need uh, you need lots and lots of nodal points of discovery because we don't know what the solutions are. That's really the whole point is that the, think about opening up right now that um, we're, we're trying to understand what it looks like to open up safely. Well, what solution works in one place may, may be somewhat different in another place. And we can provide some clear guidance from the top and from, from uh, uh, the center and from agencies that are tasked with helping. I think guidance is important. Um, leveraging the best uh, the the best understanding of of the challenge, but on the ground you're going to have both different opportunities and different challenges. And so, I mean, this is what federalism is: is that it is a um, it it's a, a a team of experimenters trying out different solutions. And so that's what a polycentric order is: is that it is. It recognizes that nodal points of discovery and solutions tend not to come from one central point, but rather tend to bubble up through lots of decentralized experimentation. Yeah, these are fantastic themes that are really permeate through the classical liberal mm, tradition. And so I would encourage the, the listeners to check out Elinor Ostrom, the uh, only woman that ever won the Nobel Prize in economics and also her husband's work. Not true Vincent now. Ostrom. Not true now, well, recently, exactly, that was updated. She was the first one, let's put it that way. She was the um, first one. She was the first one, and uh, her research is really fascinating, so I encourage you to all check it out. And please also continue to, to ask questions in the chat because I'm collecting them here, and then we can address them in 10 minutes or so. So then let's shift a little bit gears, and what kind of mistakes do you see right now? Governments, or maybe the federal government here, 
uh, during, during the time of fighting COVID-19. So uh, we've already touched on, on one area of concern. So like the CDC, for example, in insisting upon that they would be the, the one solution towards testing um, meant that all the other experiments that were happening in university labs, for example, that got put on hold. And then it became catastrophic, um, or it was, it was devastating that when, those, when the CDC tests were contaminated, then we didn't have any redundancy. And so that's an example of, of, of how a sort of top-down monocentric approach rather than a polycentric approach um, uh, got in our own way. But I, but I also wanna point to the, the discourse around uh, the challenges that we're facing because I think that's, that's a little more subtle. I think it's one that's less obvious. I think there's a, there's a natural tension right now between freedom and security. And saying that does not mean that I've identified the solution. I think it's just one among many examples where we can have a tension between we certainly want to maintain individual rights and individual liberty, and also we, we want to protect the um, protection of, of the public and public health is also an important thing. And so you'll have officials, public officials, who lean in one direction or the other. I think that's natural. I don't think that there's anything nefarious about that as a, uh, you know, on, on a top line. Some officials, though, that are leaning towards the freedom side have blown their credibility when they basically ignore the medical science and public health science. On the other side, public officials that lean towards the security end of this balance they blow their credibility by pretending that public policy is only aimed at one thing. It's all about saving lives, period, right? And that's, that's a problem because it means that our, our political discourse around this, well, our discourse around this has become politicized and polarized so that it becomes much more of a tribal test, of a, a test of tribal affiliation rather than reason, thoughtful, give and take, back and forth. Let's, let's try and figure out what the solution is here. How do we balance this? So the takeaway, I think that classical liberals, you know, both care about, you know, all care about are one, one theme within the classical liberal tradition is that truth matters and evidence-based research matters and we should pay attention to it. And also the other, another theme is that trade-offs are real. So when we think about the public health consequences of COVID-19, I think we do ourselves a disservice if we ignore the, the medical science on it. We also do a disservice um, to ourselves if we, uh, if we let the public health consequences of the pandemic be the only thing we focus in on. We also wanna look at say the public health consequences of poverty, of food insecurity, of increased incidence of violent crime as we have a prolonged economic downturn. So, it's it's problematic when we let the sort of narrative go unchallenged when uh, it gets framed as, well, what do you care about? Do you care about human life or do you care about profits? Well, that's that's a disingenuous move. What we should care about is the fact is the fact that we're in a really complicated set of circumstances where if we if we maximize around one margin, say like saving lives due to that, the, you know, that, that are caused by COVID-19, we could be actually creating other sorts of public health concerns over in other areas. Certainly we're having an impact on, on the economy. That matters too, to human well-being. And to sort of disparage it, those concerns as being somehow unimportant is not helpful. Uh, so I think that that's a big area of, of uh, concern that I see is that uh, leadership does matter. Uh, the messages we're getting from the center matter. Very similar story to the signaling effects that happened in, in uh, the wake of Hurricane Katrina is that the, the signals that the um, officials were sending was getting read by people and people were making decisions based on those signals. And if, and if it's, there isn't clarity around the fact that truth matters. And if there isn't clarity around the fact that there are real trade-offs that we need to take seriously, if it is all, if it's all political 
in its in its and polarizing in its in its rhetoric if our rhetoric comes out that way we're really doing a disservice to the american public yeah these are excellent excellent points that if politicians rather try to look at the next election and what they think the best talking points are instead of like looking really what is the data what is the evidence what is the best course of of uh, yeah the next policy step would be i think that that's an important thing that we need to take into account and it's, at it's the really same also time, the, let me jump in on that point. At, at the same time, we want to pay attention to this, the science, but we don't want to um, uh, fall into the trap that F.A. Hayek warned us of, of scientism, where it's as if human society is sort of like, you know, billiards on the billiard, uh, billiard table that we can just sort of move them around at will. No, they're going to be unintended consequences to our decision making. So we need to take that into account. And also we want scientific evidence, but we don't want, uh, we, do, we want that to be a contested field that there are lots of points of view. We do want experts at the table advising um, state and federal government for sure, um, but but those experts are fallible, and and we need to we need to be able to have a space that scrutinizes their findings and their recommendations in the Republic of Science because they're not error free either. So when we think about scientism, where it gets really scary is when scientism is married to state power. Uh, because then we just don't have any checks anymore, um, either on the use of state authority or on the scientific um, consensus that, that emerges. I'm all for trying to get to a scientific consensus as long as it r remains a contestable field and we can challenge the best thinking you know, all the time. It doesn't get locked in as something that says, okay, this is now a sort of holy writ that we have to follow and we can't challenge anymore. Yeah, and these challenges are sometimes incredibly hard. Um, people don't like uh, you and I because we are economists, because we are uh, always making arguments that are a little bit inconvenient. Because the problem is we're dealing with a disease that harms people, obviously, and we want to keep everyone safe. But it has become hard to make arguments about like, okay, what does this mean for the life and the well-being of people who are just locked down for, for the longest period of time? We have seen like, not only unemployment shooting through the roof, but with that came also like more violence in homes. We see like more drug abuse. We see suicides going up. And we need to point out to that as well to get like the full picture. But sometimes these arguments are not heard because people say like, oh, you're dismissing everyone who's, who's suffering from, from this uh, really unfortunate COVID-19 disease. But that's not the argument that we're making. So, but bringing all of these sides to uh, respectful discourse is incredibly hard, especially since it's so politicized and people looking at um, of course, the U.S. elections uh, coming up here in November and so forth. Um, so these are excellent points. Um, so this seems to be like very wicked problems. But from your classical liberal perspective, can you tell us a little bit more about like, what do you think from a, from a classical liberal viewpoint? What are the hardest problems that a classical liberal society needs to deal with? So sometimes the... Uh, it is exactly questions like this. Collective action problems tend to be those that uh, that get put in front of us, and so we're right in the middle of of the the classic hard case of well, we would we would want to have uh, government solutions in the case of a global pandemic, wouldn't we? I mean, th these are the, the you know that that when you follow your own uh, self interest, you might be harming others. These are. And so we need a collective response to this. These tend to be put forward as the, uh, the archetypical examples of, of a challenge to classical liberals. I, I think that we should be embracing those challenges and thinking hard about them because I think that, that this is uh, a moment where we do need to think about where is it, does it make sense to um, have government action that might trade off against individual liberty? that might be the right question, that might be the right solution in any one moment, then we sh sure as heck need to then be thinking about, well, then how do we roll back the growth of government in that context to address that ratchet effect that you were describing earlier? Then our focus needs to be on how do we roll back uh, the, uh, uh, the growth of the state in our private civic and, and business lives once things let up. So I think those are, are important 
challenges for the classical liberal intellectual community. And we've got a lot of people thinking of, thinking about, about how to address that. Um, but with that said, I think that there are um, sort of themes within classical liberal intellectual traditions that are so important. One is we've already talked about is um, that there are real trade-offs, real trade-offs as you just uh, beautifully articulated and that those trade-offs can't be ignored. The other, um, uh, another theme would be the law of unintended consequences. So this goes to the um, sort of, you know, not treating human society as if it's um, a game of billiards. And uh, that it's not just a physics of, of human society, that human beings respond in particular ways. So for example, in some states, uh, liquor stores were shut down. And the logic was, well, you know, you don't need liquor stores to survive and, uh, and there's risk for you to go to the liquor store. There's, you're putting other people at risk. Um, so we're gonna close the liquor stores down. Well, what did people do? Well, they just then got in their car, they drove to a neighboring state where the liquor stores had not been closed down. If there had been a um, contagion in, in that community, they've just now spread it to another community. Or if there's a contagion in the second community, they've now acquired it. So we've created a bigger public health challenge because we closed down the liquor stores. And so, uh, and, if, and if you might say, well then, okay, then the neighboring states should close down their liquor stores. Okay, but that's going to invite, you know, the black market in, in liquor sales, just as we had in uh, prohibition. And then, then we've got violence being the adjudicator in turf wars. Is that what we want? Again, think of thinking about the sort of unintended negative consequences of public policy and recognizing that there's no perfect solution. And so given that, it would have been much smarter to just say right from the get-go, we're not going to close liquor stores down. Uh, we can give liquor stores guidance, clear guidance, and maybe we, we do have a system of fines if they don't adhere to this guidance of keeping uh, the um, uh, clients separated and safe as best as they possibly can. Uh, people know that they're taking a risk when they're going into uh, the public, whether they're buying a can of peas or whether they're buying a bottle of liquor. So we need to let people also have some agency and part in that they can play in being a part of the solution that doesn't lead to these massive unintended consequences as, as I've just described. Very good. Um, that makes a lot of sense and it echoes some of the other themes in, in your research also, the way you say you need like different trial and error because ex ante, before the fact, we don't necessarily know what is the best policy situation and best sol policy solution. And again, it depends on the circumstances of time and place. So that's uh, really good insights. But let me now go to some of the questions that we have sure. received. Um, now, one we have one from uh, somebody from the Czech Republic. Uh, her name is Emma. She asks, um, what is your opinion, Emily, on paid human ch challenge trials focused on testing healthy candidates and exposing them to COVID in order to expedite the ways to finding and winning vaccines? So we're Emma? not asking you easy questions. Yeah, I'm, I, uh, I, I appreciate the question. I'm gonna stay in my lane. Because I think that this is the case where you know you don't want the economist uh, who's not an expert in public health, uh, you know, uh, making any call like this. So the first thing I would do is I would want to I would want to understand the 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 risks, both the health risks, um, but also the benefits of of this. Because I would assume that there are some risks associated with this, but I would imagine that there's also some significant benefits. So that's the way I would ask the question is, is to then recognize that there are trade-offs. Um, I don't know enough to um, uh, weigh, weigh in one way or another, but the, that would be the framework of questions I would go into. Those would, those would, that would be the, the way to prime your own mind as you're entering into and listening to the, um, to the uh uh, debates on this. And where you should be skeptical is if you hear uh, a, uh, a response that says, uh, well, there might be a loss of a life in the human trial, so we can't allow it at all. That's, that's ignoring the fact that there are very real trade-offs. And so we, so we need to be embracing the fact that the, that the world is, is one in which these trade-offs are real. There are no perfect solutions. So I would be much more inclined to trust the expertise that takes that 
uh, that reality of trade-offs into consideration, and then is weighing and, and then is making a an educated judgment based on the weights of those costs and benefits. Very good. And this is uh, your answer is like a prime example how you can distinguish scholars within the classical liberal tradition from the some of the experts that claim to know everything. We say that sometimes we don't know, or we need to listen to some other folks instead of like giving the answer to everything, which is of course, like one of the main pillars of classical liberalism to be humble enough to say that we don't know how we need to organize society and some of these complicated questions um, from the get-go, but we do know what kind of tools and resources can work in order to come up with good solutions. So let me now rephrase the questions that Regino from uh, Mexico, from Mexico is asking us. He says, like in Orle New Orleans, it was good to let people go out, make their own decisions regarding their own health, their own safety, to rebuild their communities. Should we do the same thing right now during COVID-19, where people make decisions for themselves in the same way? Would you say that's that's this you would advise the same reasoning there, there or no? Yeah, there is there is a similarity, though I don't, but though I do think that there's a there's some important differences too. In the context of post-Katrina. Uh, the post-Katrina context, I definitely think that there was a bias towards this overcautiousness uh, that I described, that people were kept out of their neighborhoods um, with public safety rationale. Well, you've got to stay out of your neighborhood because it's just not safe enough yet. Well, what that meant is that people were kept out and guess what happens in an empty neighborhood? It becomes all that much less safe. So in the um, uh, Ninth Ward neighborhoods, for example, people were kept out of where uh, the community had been uh, most badly damaged uh, with that rationale. But what happened in the, because no one was there, no one was present, uh, people, other people came in and saw it as like an opportunity to just abscond with resources. One of the things that people lost was the copper pipe, uh, plumbing underneath the houses. Cause it's pretty easy to crawl under these houses that, you know, um, uh, typically don't have basements, carving out the uh, copper pipes could then be sold as scrap. It was at a time uh, when this hit, it was at a time when the uh, price of copper was, was really high. So that then created yet another problem as if the people didn't, who had their lives devastated and their homes devastated. Now, the one thing that you could come back to in the wake of a flood is that the plumbing would be okay. It was copper plumbing, it was perfectly nice, but now even that's gone. Right. So it created yet another problem. And so uh, one of the things that we would um, would have wanted to see is that people who had the wherewithal to come back should have been allowed to come back. I think with all sorts of appropriate warnings to say, if you're a person who's at risk for your health, if you're someone who's likely to need emergency services, it won't be coming. So don't come back unless you've got a way to make sure that you're going to be safe, that you can get the that, that you're not at medical risk, for example. So that's, that's a similarity, right? But it is, it is different now in that if one person came back to a um, devastated community, it typically did not put other people in danger, at least not a whole swath of people in danger. And that's what's different about this. So that creates, that makes it a different sort of problem. So I want to acknowledge that that's an important difference. But going back to Reginald's question, which was, but could we devolve the decision-making process? I do think that at least in the at least after the the peak is is in the rearview mirror, then we do need to devolve the process so that we can allow for local experimentation. Um, even before the, the stay-at-home orders started to uh, just cascade across the country, a lot of businesses were already figuring out how they could maintain product productivity safely. Um, and some couldn't, so they had already decided we're going to close because there's no way we can serve our customers and, and, and make sure our employees are safe. So they had already closed down. So in some ways, the you know, when we think about the stay at home orders, the, the challenge there is that it becomes a very, very blunt instrument that immediately ceases all of that experimentation that's going on. Maybe there's a rationale for that. Maybe there's a good argument for that. But even if let's say, let's, uh, let's say that there is a, a good rationale for that sort of blunt instrument, as soon as we can lift that blunt instrument and we should allow for um, businesses, uh, uh, community leaders, 
uh, churches, universities, small colleges, schools, figuring out solutions to their, and, and those solutions might be replicable in other places, but they certainly won't be applicable everywhere. And that's why we need a kind of, of laboratory, a, syst a system of labs that are experimenting with solutions. And that would be more on par with that polycentric approach. And so I do think that there is that lesson that carries over from the Katrina disaster to this current pandemic. Yeah, and this sort of trial and error approach, I think I find very convincing that that will probably lead to a reduction of harm overall. But most people who just believe in one size fits all solutions and look at the government for uh, basically trying to resolve everything in our lives and, and the crisis overall. It's, it's a hard argument to make because we cannot say before we, we see all of these experiment, experiments turn out, what is the best solution? And so it's always easier to believe that government just fixes it. And they claim and nor that can do. we claim that there won't be people harmed with exactly. this experimentation. There will be people harmed with this experimentation, but it's disingenuous to suggest that there's no harm done with the top-down approach, right? So it's it's not that one solution provides um, you know, no or provides solutions with no harm. That's just not on the table. There's just different kinds of harm. And at some point we need to sort of unleash the create the creative capacity of uh, civil society, of the business community, so that we can come upon the solutions that work best. I mean, some communities, for example, you know, have already developed uh, solutions to social distancing of restaurants and cafes and things like that by saying, no one's coming up and down the street anymore. Let's close off the street to, to um, car traffic so that we can have expanded room between tables. Well, that's a great idea that is not going to work everywhere, but it could work in some places. But only if you are given that scope of um, opportunity to experiment, are you going to come up with solutions like that? So the specific question that, that Anne-Marie is, is raising um, about this is uh, she's asking, should businesses and sporting events be allowed to screen people um, with diagnostic tests or temperature tests in order to say like, yes, you allowed into my venue or not? Do you think that's a good solution? Yeah, I, I, this is one of those areas where uh, it's a very different thing uh, to have a government say you must be tested, which raises concerns about um, how they, um, uh, it, it raises individual liberty concerns in a way that is not the same thing if it's a private venue that says, yeah, come on into the concert. Um, we've done the analysis. We think that we can pe keep people safe reasonably if we um, uh, check everybody's temperature before they come in, or if there is a scalable test that can be administered quickly and at and it, and it, uh, low cost, perhaps even testing right as you're coming in might, might uh, be on the horizon. In those cases, as long as you've got the exit option, right? I, I think that individual liberty remains intact. So I'm not at all uh, concerned about that. Again, I think that some employers might want to try that, and then some employees might not like it very much. And then I, I think that then we're going to see whether or not that's um, a, a viable thing for employers to do, depending on how people respond to that. Um, but but some of us will say, actually, I'm more inclined to uh, return to work, knowing that there's this other layer of of, uh, of security. And as long as I'm assured that my, my medical information remains private, um, I'll, I'll buy in, right? I'll opt in. So as long as there's an exit option, as long as people can opt in or opt out of these solutions, I do think that private property owners, private business, private businesses um, can also be a part of this experimentation of what solutions have viability and can work. So where do you see the world heading like if you had to make a prediction and i know classical liberals tend to make like pattern predictions instead of firm predictions but we're living in a radically different world than just a couple of months ago um so if you had to think about that what how do you see that the world is going to change within the next couple of months or even the next year what kind of permanent changes are you expecting yeah i, I think that the uh, disruption is uh, the disruption is real and it's going to be persistent and i think that's and, and that will change people's behavior in ways that are likely non-reversible. There's, there's few moments where we can, uh, there's few moments in history 
uh, where certainly not in my lifetime where I can say, okay, the world's changed and there's no going back, right? Or there's no, that's going to permanently alter the way we do things. I could think of a couple of cultural shifts that we've had in our lifetime, Wolf, where um, that's been the case, but it's it's pretty rare. And I do think that there will be some uh, things uh, that are permanently shifted in this. And so one of the things that we're looking at now is the future of work and uh, and and office environments and how essential do we see it as being proximate to one another in our work environments? There will be some industries that remain very much focused on a place-based, um, uh, local face-to-face -face engagement just because of the nature of their business. But I think that we're going to see a lot more experimentation, people's appetite for uh, telecommuting, commuting, people's appetite for telemedicine, for example, just totally dramatic shift. That's really, that really can open up this space in ways that I think are a challenge, but also super exciting as well. Because if we can break down barriers to people gaining access to medical care, what a set of opportunities that opens up for people across society. That's that's wonderful. That makes sense, and um, I mean, there's some good coming out of it. But um, also, you have to. What, what I'm trying to grapple with the most right now is thinking through like how the economy in general will look like, because so many people are unemployed right now here in, sure. in the U.S., but also around the world, and how they all find their ways back into into employment. Uh, that is definitely a puzzle that we will not try to solve right now, but uh, sure. certainly something to to think about for sure. Um, we're getting close to the end right now, but maybe I can uh, ask one more question here from the audience. And thank you so much for, for answering them, though, so far, Emily. It's, it's, it's riveting. Um, we have a question about if you see some specific states, or if you want to extend it to countries, where you think that their approach towards balancing the trade-offs is, mm -hmm. is really well done right now. Yeah, I, I'd like to shift to um, an industry, if I, if I could. I think that the opportunity, um, and, and then you're seeing differences across the states in this industry, but in higher education is a really interesting, and it's, and I get it. I mean, that's, I geek out on higher ed. Um, so that's, that's my thing. Um, but it's, um, it's one of the areas or industries that I think we have real opportunity to learn, you know, so lots of the experimentation about people um, having different and non-reversible appetites for um, online education, that might change, right? Um, but I think also those organizations, those institutions that are really committed to that intense transformational person-to-person, -person, intimate scale, human scaled uh, higher education, they're also gonna need to figure out how to do this in a world where that, that could get disrupted. And how do they do that? Not just in a way that makes do, you know, in the moment, but says, no, we can, we can deliver our preferences in person, but we can deliver that same transformational learning uh, in, in a, a remote experience. They need to figure that out. I think we are figuring that out, but it's very much a, an emergent um, area for us and in higher education. But just also think about a big university. That's like a, that's like a, a small city in many cases. If they can, if they can, if we can see the, the larger universities and the smaller places figure out how they accomplish what they need to accomplish and still keep people reasonably safe, that's going to be a source of tremendous learning. Now, I say all this in, a again, a, an industry that is fundamentally disrupted, fundamentally disrupted uh, because of just if for no other reason, the finances of if the fall semester is lost, for example, that will be devastating to many institutions of higher learning. So I'm not underestimating how painful a lot of the um, ramifications of this will be in higher ed. But I do think that there's a real opportunity to, to still think about the, the artisan craft of teaching and of learning in a context where we can't always rely on being close face to face. How do we maintain that? That's, that's a question. I don't pretend to have all the answers by any, by any stretch, but what I'm excited to see is that there are going to be institutions committed to having to find the solution. And we're going to learn a ton in this next semester, in this next academic year. 
That's wonderful. And the Institute for Main Studies is such an institution that helps uh, institutions throughout higher education. So please uh, follow Emily and her work at theihs.org. Emily, do you want to say any other closing thoughts, any things that uh, people should check out regarding your work at the IHS or your academic work that you want to plug? Yeah, I know that um, the uh, SFL listeners, uh, especially those that are early in their career um, in uh, in in their in their college career and thinking about next steps, if you're thinking about an a career in the world of ideas, specifically a career in the academy. If you're thinking about graduate school, please be in touch with us because that's what we do is we support uh, scholars at every stage of their scholarly career from the time they're first thinking about, about pursuing a career in ideas um, all the way up through you know, full professors. Uh, uh, we uh, work with scholars across the arc of that scholarly career. So uh, we want to hear from you and, uh, and check us out on uh, the IHS.org. That's great. I can only recommend you all doing that. And with that, Emily, thank you so, so much for taking the time today to, to share with us uh, your viewpoints and your research about Katrina and your outlook on, on COVID-19. Uh, it was a pleasure. And with that, um, continue checking out also studentsforliberty.org. We have every day like two to three online events about all kinds of different topics um, and a lot of webinars and YouTube and Twitch and all kinds of exciting things. So go check us out. And with that, um, stay all safe and sane out there. And I'm looking forward to talking to you soon again. Thank, Thank you, Wolf. Thank you.